in progress. Well, good morning, everyone. Can we uh, begin our study with a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful uh, for the light that you've been giving us, for the things that we have found in your word, in history. We are thankful, Lord, for uh, the way that you speak to our hearts and bring conviction. We know that our understanding is limited and we need you to guide and direct us. We pray for each person. We know this, the struggles that many face are, are very difficult, but they need you. And we just pray that you can bring your presence near and that they can know that you are watching over them and that you have foreseen everything. Thank you for hearing our prayer. And we invite your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Um, yes. Yeah. So we have had a um, number of things that, that we still have not resolved in Judges chapter 5. And we haven't gone through all of it yet. But we're, we're picking our way through it, and then we'll go back. Uh, the main thing that we've been addressing is um, these different tribes. And as I pointed out yesterday, it seems to me that there's this um, some type, type of mathematical language that's used here. And we did have, um, I'm going to have to remember to do this the right way. Um, so Stephen had talked about uh, Issachar, for instance. So we had this, um, and glass is not working. Um, so we counted Issachar from October 22, 1844, and that brought us to which date, Stephen? The uh, 7th, 7th of November, uh, 2020. Okay. That was when Joe Biden was confirmed as the winner. Right. So we're going to have the confirmation of Joe Biden. And I'm going to have to do it this way. Just hang on. Um, cause I got your diagram here, but I'm just going to download it so that I can avoid some of the problems we had yesterday. So, <clears throat> so the idea is that we can take these, these, the numbering of these tribes and we can use them as spans of time. Now, I wanted to analyze this just a little bit more. So we had this argument, not like a, a disagreement, but just uh, put forward a series of propositions that if we take um, these kings that line up, so we have um, Cambyses, these are the three kings that will yet stand up in Persia, Cambyses, Falsmyrtus, and Darius the Persian. And the fourth is Xerxes. And then we have the sons of Leah as well that are being lined up. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, and then Issachar. And then the presidents, Clinton, George W. Bush, Obama, Trump, and Biden. So this relates to the study that we did on the presidents of the United States. And... What we're suggesting here is that Issachar lines up with Biden. And what were some of the symbols that tied Issachar to Biden, besides the fact of just counting them? It was in the, the blessing, Jacob's blessing on Issachar. So what did we find about Issachar? His name means man of fire. The man of fire. Which would so we connect well with Biden. Yes. And what about the the donkey? 
Well, Issachar is a strong ass couching down between bur two burdens. Okay. And and the donkey would be a symbol of? Democrat Party. So the Democratic Party, right? So so we could apply that symbol there. Uh, it's also a symbol of Islam, right? So we know that there is uh, in in the story of Balaam, it's it uh, the ass falls down, right? And so there's this symbol here. But as as we were addressing the words that are used here for couching down can also be crouching down or it can be fallen down as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and the idea is that it can't bear the burden and there's a double burden placed upon uh, this, this ass, right? So, um, so we could take those as being uh, the other powers that it's caught between. So, so there are some, uh, some very good symbolism here that would tie this. Now, when we look here in this line above, uh, who follows Xerxes? There's uh, some debate. I'm not yeah. here when I was looking at it. Some people list it as Artabanus. And then others say, no, he was like a, he killed Xerxes, but he didn't take the throne. Right. And then, uh, and then it would be Artaxerxes who uh, gives the third decree. Right. Is yeah. So, thanks so, so nobody denies that Artabanus is there. It's just his significance. Right. Whether he actually becomes ruler or not. So that's not known. But I think part of the argument of why they don't include him has to do with Ptolemy's canon, for the most part. But we know Artaxerxes is going to follow Xerxes with Artabanus in there temporarily, in, in whatever capacity we look at it. Because uh, we don't have Artaxerxes become king as soon as Xerxes is dead. Right? Correct. Okay. So, so that would line up with Biden. Um, so this sort of a, a placeholder, per se, if, if we wanted to look at it that way. I don't know if that makes sense to people, but. No, that, that makes great sense because they admitted with Biden that he was not going to be a strong president, that he was just there as a placeholder. Yeah. So. One of the other one of the other points that I've had to consider in this um, is this time with Xerxes and Trump. Is that similar to the ending of the the seven good years of Joseph and Biden, the beginning of the seven bad years? Okay. Hmm. What what else could we use to, you know, flesh that out a little bit? How would you? Well, would you try to that? okay. In in fleshing that out, what what were the events that were happening at the beginning of the seven bad years? You have the people agreeing to sell their land, their animals etc to the government and isn't that what really has been happening in america since biden became president i mean people are taking out substantial loans especially the business people in order to try to survive yeah now we, we look at this as the sunday law that is we have this seven years of plenty in in that story but we mark the sunday law in connection with the seven years of famine. And we have the two years into the famine when when Jacob enters into Egypt. Right. right as part of this structure, this the center of the 430 years. And uh, under Trump, we have the pandemic, 
but it's going to be under Biden that we have the federal mandates, not right. under Trump. Um, which, which, which to me is kind of interesting in that the pandemic typifies the Sunday law, but under Trump, he doesn't act as a dictator. No. Which, which to me was, you know, the whole thing that everyone was predicting. Trump was going to be just, but of course he's a constitutionalist. So he's not going to step outside the constitution. He's not going to bring federal mandates. He's going to leave things up to the states. He's not going to act like a dictator, but Biden does. Um, Very much. So in some ways, is is Biden kind of, I don't know how to explain it, maybe a, a repeat of history of that Sunday law that first happens under Trump, but that we could look at a type of Sunday law under, during the seven years of plenty, we don't really see what we normally would say is a Sunday law, though it's setting up things for what's going to happen under the famine. But I, yeah, so I don't know. There's something there that I don't quite put together. Well, as as Stephen put out in this diagram. Yes. The first decree occurred under which ruler? Um, well, the the decree you mean of of to rebuild Cyrus. Jerusalem. Well, that's going to be Cyrus. Okay, so. Where's Cyrus in this line? He's outside the line. Yeah, because he's the time of the end, right? So this isn't the time of the end. This is a period uh, because you're going to have uh, the second decree under Darius. Right. So that's going to be the arrival of an, an, of the first angels, or the second angel's message is going to have happen under Darius. Okay. So at this point, we know that the third decree is not going to be under Xerxes. No. And we know that the third decree is not going to be under Artabanus. Right. So are we in a, a time of preparation in order to be able to give that third decree? To see well, that we're, yeah, yeah, because we're in the time of the second angel's message. Because that second angel's message began under Darius, mm -hmm. or as as we would look at it, under Obama. Yeah, and is currently continuing, very much like what we were seeing under this with the Millerites from what was it, eight, roughly eighteen forty two to eighteen forty four. Yeah, well. Yeah, so 42 to 44, because you're starting with the, the charts and the doors being closed and so forth. Right. Normally, we put the arrival of the second angel's message now at April 19th, but there's a preparation to all of that. So, I mean, how you define that, I think we've defined it differently at different times. But, but we can see that there is these events happening before so where we would put the arrival of the second angel if you're going to apply it to these leaders it would have to be under trump at least that's unless we're going to say that it happens yeah i would say it has to happen under trump because when biden comes into power january 6 that's going to be midnight that's going to be raffia well here again, we're looking, going back to this with, with Joseph and Genesis. Cambyses, False Smyrtus, and Darius are part of the seven good years. Under Xerxes, we have the close of the seven good years. And then as we segue into Artabanus, Biden, we're at the beginning of the seven bad years. Okay, so let's put it this way. Uh, the, um, how about during Trump? We do have the seven bad years begin. No disagreement. Right, that is we have the pandemic. So that, that would be the famine. 
right? And that's going to happen under Trump. But maybe Biden would mark uh, the point two years into the famine. All right. Where Joseph and meets with his family. So Jacob comes into Egypt. Maybe maybe that's one way to look at it. I don't know if that's correct or not. Well, I mean, if, that's, if, that's when you're going to have everyone selling their stuff. It, it, it takes a little bit of time for that to occur. So you get a famine, but, you know, people can kind of survive the first year. Right, because they're just going to buy grain from, but then then they don't have money, so now they have to sell their land. And we had discussion regarding this, where this actually occurs, and, and we had that as the second year, not like at the end of the seven years of famine. At least begins in the second year. Do you remember any of that, Stephen, regarding that discussion? Or anyone else? Well, I have a memory of it. Okay. Yes, sir. But we also have Joseph's two sons being born before the famine came. And that was in Genesis 41.50. Okay. Yeah, so you're saying Ephraim and Manasseh are born prior to the famine. Right, because Genesis 41.50, and unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, yeah. when Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bare unto him. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing with the two sons as a symbol? Well. You marking midnight or something, or? Well, I'm mark, I mark. I don't know if we can mark midnight, but two sons in Joseph's house. I mean, we we now have two of the tribes that are going to go into the promised land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a question as to how we're going to mark them as a symbol. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so let's, let's just move over to the diagram below. So we're taking the number of 64,300 days, an inclusive count, from October 22, 1844 to November 7th, 2020. So this is the numbering of the tribes of Issachar. In Numbers chapter 26. Now, in um, Issachar gains, I believe, is it 5,000 or 9,900 in that period of time? Uh, if I remember, because I think it's normally 54,400 or something like yeah. So, yeah, because Issachar is 54,400 in Numbers chapter 2, or chapter 1, whichever chapter it is, and, um, and then gains 9,900. So... Uh, so one of the things that, that, that we're addressing here in this has to do with, um, and it deals with Issachar here, and the princes of Issachar with, with Deborah, Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley, for the divisions of Reuben were great thoughts of heart. So with Issachar, what does this mean that part of Issachar was with Deborah and part of Issachar with Barak? That's Judges 5.15. So, so when we look at Issachar, so remember the, the, the 10,000 is going to be Zebulun and Naphtali. 
they're going to be the ones that are with that army. But we have the princes of Issachar, we're with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak. So why the princes of Issachar? And, and it's not mentioned, of course, in chapter 4. So how, how do we take this? Any any thoughts? I'm trying to puzzle through this after puzzling through some things in Genesis, so I don't have a direct answer. <clears throat> okay, so um, anybody else with thoughts on this, how we would... What I did see is that Barak was sent on foot into the valley. So what was this, sir? He, he fled on foot. So maybe we should look at what this on foot is all about. As I think Ron had brought that up. Was it Ron or, uh, or William? That, that was Ron. But uh, I, don't, I don't agree with what he's trying to point out there. I, I don't, I just too obscure. So... Um, I just don't think that it you can take that application of foot that he's trying to make. What was the application? Was the oh, I don't want to, I, instead of God? No, no, no. Uh, I don't want to talk about it. So anyway, um, <laughs> okay. If you look at the meaning, you'll see. But I don't want to talk about it because um, I know All where right. it's going. So, so the idea here is that. Uh, he's going to be on foot, right? So he's sent on foot into the valley. This is just they're traveling on foot, right? But that's the that's the point. There's no hidden meaning there. Okay. Okay. So just curious because right now everything is uh, popping up and wondering does this have a hidden meaning for us? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I don't want to discuss it. Okay. What what Ron wanted to discuss. So um, now, so here we have uh, they're sent on foot into the valley. So the valley is the important thing. So what is the valley here? Where is this valley? What does the valley represent? That's the point, I think. A crisis, a choice we must make. The valley of decision. Well, I don't think, I mean, yeah, that's true. There's a valley of decision, but I don't think that that's what it's symbolizing here. Okay. Okay, so we know um, that this word valley comes from the word deep, to be profound. That is, to cause to make deep literally or figuratively. So what is the discussion about? What is this message that... You know, just so just think of it in the context of the message of Parminder. So we have these symbols that are being brought here. And these are countering a false message. And, and here we have, so we have here on this chart, so let's look at this. Let's try to understand this. We have the Great Disappointment, October 22nd, 1844. And we have... The counting of Issachar. So Judges 5.15 is going to give us Issachar as one of the tribes that we can then use as a span of time. That's the way that I understand it.
And it says it was, was with Deborah. So Deborah is the spirit of prophecy, right? That's the way we understand this. Now we have Jeff Pippinger's born on November 7th, 1951. And what, what Stephen is doing is he's taking the 69 days from the midnight cry on August 15th, 1844, an inclusive count to October 22nd, and he's going to look at the fact that Jeff is 69 years old on November 7th, 2020. So how does this relate to the idea the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak? He was sent on foot into the valley, for the divisions of Reuben were great, the thoughts of heart. So we could probably leave out the last part. Let's just do was sent on foot into the valley. And, and the divisions of Reuben, whatever these are, we know there's two different divisions because the divisions of Reuben is mentioned twice. And, and they're mentioned with great thoughts of heart on the one hand and great searchings of heart on the other, which seem to be two different ways of understanding God's word. Does anybody understand what, what I'm getting at here? Could, could the divisions of Reuben be representative of the divisions within the movement itself? Well, yes, that's the point. And, and because of Reuben, so Reuben represents a man, right? That's his, his standard. Right. And we, we could tie the structure of Parminder, that is, if we go from uh, specifically um, November 4th, 1888, which is the end of the, uh, the general conference session in 1888. Right. And we count the number that we have for the tribe of Reuben, which is, um, I think it was... 46,500. Right. So we counted that and that went to Parminder's ordination. Right. February 27th, uh, 2016. So, so we could tie Reuben to Parminder. So Reuben has to do with a particular understanding of something. And, and maybe, maybe it's an understanding of, of something to do with some aspect of this message that there's a division on. So what's 1888 known for? The rejection of the third angel's message. Of, of righteousness by faith, right? Correct. And we know that Parminder is going to introduce a counterfeit. He's actually going to introduce new theology into the movement in a very clever disguise, right? He's going he's gonna to undermine the message of righteousness by faith with a counterfeit message. Hugely. Yeah. And, and he doesn't, what he doesn't want to do is he doesn't want to have a discussion regarding the nature of Christ. He only wants to have a discussion regarding the nature of man. But in so doing, he's undermining our understanding of the nature of Christ. Correct? Agreed. Right. And Agreed. so, yeah, so, and, and it was very subtle um, what he was doing because there, you know, again, it's truth mixed with error, but it, it was a way of attacking the nature of Christ, but not head on. And, and, and people saw the implications and they would tell Jeff and then Jeff would go to Parminder. And since Parminder wasn't really talking about the nature of Christ, he would just agree with Jeff. Right. So he didn't make direct statements regarding the nature of Christ, but but the implications were there. And Jeff wasn't really following Parminder's presentations, so he didn't know. So could it have to do with the issue of understanding uh, righteousness by faith? The divisions of Reuben have to do with the two different understandings.
that would make logical sense. Okay. So, so now we have this, this understanding, at least tentatively, regarding the divisions of Reuben. But we have, to, we have this issue of Issachar. So we, we've done it with Reuben. We've done it with Zebulun. We've done it with Naphtali. We have these spans of time and some other spans, which we're not going to look at right now, but we will put them all together. But now we're dealing with this Issachar, which I think would have to be correct. But the question is, what is Issachar representing? Because we're connecting it to the great disappointment. So God declares the end from the beginning, right? Yes. Okay, so, so that's why when we look at 1888, November 4th, and we connect it with Reuben, uh, we're connecting it with a message given by Parminder. And that message he's going to give in 2016 um, after he's ordained. Because I don't know if people remember specifically, but in 2016, he's, um, he's beginning this message that we can know the tares, that we can we can... We can understand which are the tares and which are the wheat. And also this message regarding uh, the movement does not sin. And this is leading to his whole idea on the nature of man. So there's a whole idea of what conversion is. You know, one of the things he said in, 2000, uh, in 2017 is that basically... Uh, all we have to do is be nice. And that's easy to do, that man can be nice. He didn't really understand the problem of sin. And of course, Parminder is not very nice at all, but you know, you can always imagine that you're nice. That's easy enough to do. Okay, so, so now we have Issachar. And Issachar, we're connecting to the Great Disappointment. So we have to look at what's being represented at the Great Disappointment and what's being represented with Joe Biden being announced as a winner of the election on November 7th. And I'm driving back from Collins. I believe it was the last time I was at Collins. Maybe I was there one other time after that. I don't know, but... Well, you, you have a disappointment in the sense that we were expecting Trump to, okay. to win that. Okay, so we have a disappointment, right? And so now how do we connect that to Jeff? Well, he was the one that uh, was uh, promoting that. Well, in a sense, he, he did sort of uh, waver initially when he gave the prophecy. You know, yeah. but, but then they did, they, Trump did become president. We were content, still, uh, we were understanding that he would be the last president of the United States. Right. So, so this would be a disappointment for this movement, November 7th. At least, at least symbolically. So, so we can make this connection. So we can make this connection here. Now, so when we look at um, this battle, so we have the divisions of Reuben, and we have Issachar, and we have these other tribes mentioned as well. These are going to be what? What are these tribes representing in context of our history? What is it? What is this about? Because we know we have, um, you know, Deborah and Barak, they're going to have this battle against Sisera, right? So Sisera really represents Parminder and his message, right? That's that papalism. So this is going to be attacked by... Um, Zebulun and Naphtali. But here they're going to mention these other tribes. And, and some tribes are not going to be 
involved, right? So, so they're going to mention some tribes that are going to support them, and some tribes are not. So how are we understanding these tribes? What are they representing then? Just in the general sense, how are, in our time, what are these tribes? The, they're representing numbers or spans of time, but they're connecting, they have to connect to events in the past that tie to something in the future. Now, we might put them on a date, but the question is what, what is it that we see here with Issachar? What is it that we saw with these other spans of time? How are we understanding these? Okay. Are these messages or aspects of truth? I think that yeah. gives a, a better figurative application than trying to look at this as being spans of time at the moment. Okay. Well, they are spans of time. So I'm not I'm not saying they're not, yeah. but there's a lot to consider to apply them as spans of time. Right. And so when we consider them as spans of time, they have to be connected to a message. Right. And that's what we see here in Stephen's diagram. It's connecting to something, not just to some arbitrary event, but there is a cohesiveness in understanding the span of time that, that makes sense, right? Because you can easily find some date in the past and connect it with some date in, in the present or in the recent past. And, and you can say, well, that is, um, you know, that's where we're going to connect it. So we just connect something. But you can't just connect something. You have to have a reason behind that connection. So. Um, well, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you to step back for just a second. OK. Now, in looking at this and looking at, at some of the detail that, that we're applying in this first line that you were that you had up on the screen. Okay. The the question that I was asking for our consideration is do we have the ability to apply the story of Joseph in this? Now, well, we, we do, right? So we can. Okay, but what the, the point to support what you were just saying. Yeah. We know from Genesis 4150 that his two sons were born in the seven years from the time that Joseph was brought out of prison mm -hmm. until the end of the seven years of plenty. Right. So they're, they're born during the seven years of plenty. Okay. Now, Gen in Genesis 47, 14 through to verse 24, in a, in a 10 verse selection. Okay. So we're going to go to Genesis 47, 14 to 24. Okay. The first thing that we're shown here is that Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt mm -hmm. and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Yeah. So they're going to set. They're going to spend their money and they're going to have to give up their land. No, <clears throat> giving up the land comes down the road. Yeah, I know, but they're going to start with the money first. Okay, so then we see that the money failed. Yep, that's verse 16. So, no, that's verse 15. Okay, okay, verse 15, yeah. And when the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. Mm -hmm. 
Symbolically, what are we seeing when money fails? Um, as as a symbol in. Uh, Is, okay, historically, what do we see when money fails? Well, we call it a depression or something. Um, what happened just before the complete downfall of Nazi Germany? Well, their money failed. Yeah, I had to use a wheelbarrow to bring the money to buy a loaf of bread. Exactly. So well, that was uh, that was before Nazi Germany. That was the Weimar Republic. Yeah, that's earlier. But I, I believe I, I believe Stephen, you'd find it it happened both in the Weimar Republic and in Nazi Germany. I know that my you know, I have part of my family that lived in Germany through World War II, and they made comments to my great aunt that if it had not been for some of the things that my great aunt had been sending, that they would not have made it through. Yeah. So. But yeah, the devaluation of the currency was happening earlier because um, that was after World War I, which helped Germany restore so that it could have World War II. Okay. Yeah. So anyway. when the money fails, what does Joseph request of them? In verse 16, Joseph said, give your cattle and I will give you for your cattle if money fail. So is, are they not being told not only to give up, <clears throat> to, to basically give up their tools because they honored the cattle as holy, so they were not making food from the cattle, right? Mm -hmm. They used them as tools, right? They didn't eat those things. It was how they plowed, how they how they how ground they their grain. That's right. They were a tool. Yeah. So it's how they plowed. It's how they ground their grain. It's a, it's a whole bunch of things. That, that's right, correct. So in verse 17, and they brought their cattle unto Joseph and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for the asses. And he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that month? No, for that year. So <clears throat> the economy fails, the money is worthless, the people have given up their tools, they're giving up their ability to make their living. And when that year ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, we will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath our herds of cattle. There is not anything left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land, by us and our land for, for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh and give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land be not desolate. So first he buys the tools. Now he owns the people and the land. Famine comes upon them, and they make these choices. Is this not representative then of the government in control of everything and a type of a Sunday law? Mm -hmm. But we're, we are not seeing this at the point yet. Right. So it's progressive. That's the point. Yes. 
Yeah. So we have this progression of events that's occurring. So so we could look at you know what happened under Trump is the beginning of the seven years of famine with the pandemic. Right. Right. Because you're gonna have this great economy. I mean, you have to say that Trump's economy was like the seven years of plenty. Exactly. No matter what the Democrats say about it, the fact is it was the economy was booming. And and then you're going to have the pandemic, which is going to destroy the economy. But it happens progressively. You're going to have the money failing, um, which is, you know, what we're we're seeing right now. Um, and these other types of things that that progress. So so when we say that the pandemic's the type of the Sunday law, it is, but it's just the first step. Right. I mean, and and we know that we're in the time of the Sunday law since nine eleven, um, on on one line at least, but that this is really about a coming Sunday law that ultimately is going to occur. And all of these events are part of that progression. Now, of this progression, you come to the third step. Because verse 20. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For the Egyptians sold every man his field. Because the famine prevailed over them. So the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the border of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. Mm -hmm. So rather than accepting that they had this highly agrarian nation where the people are spread out to be able to grow the grain, to, to provide the goods, Joseph moves them all into cities where they can be more easily controlled. Mm -hmm. So this is globalism, of course. This is the new world order. And this is exactly in the opposite of the advice and the counsel that Mrs. White had given. Yeah. Only the land of the priests bought he not. For the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them, wherefore they sold not their lands. Mm -hmm. So, so they represent this movement. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Or the, the 144,000 or the faithful, however. The faithful, the 144,000, yes. Mm -hmm. So... All of this, I believe, gives us, again, more of a, a microscopic examination of the line that you and Stephen were putting together yesterday, mm -hmm. dealing with this situation with Judah and Issachar, and the applications being made with Trump and with Biden. Yeah. Because the, the point from yesterday that I took away is when we have this ass that is couched down, that is under two burdens, that is falling, it's no different than, than the ass that fell before the angel of the Lord with the, with the drawn sword. Mm hmm we have an ass that cannot bear up under the burdens. Now, remember, we have Islam connected with that. And it's we very true. Islam to be involved in, and it's not presently, though we have to believe that it will be when we move further down the line. Well, exactly. And at this, at this point, just like what was happening in the time of Joseph, Joseph purchased not only the cattle, but the flocks and the asses. Mm -hmm. So there's some additional symbology there that we have not really delved into. 
but is pertinent to what we're dealing with within the movement right now. Yeah. Now, one of the things I don't like that, that I find that people do. So we look at the headlines of today and, you know, we'll look at what's happening in Russia or we'll look what's happening in China and we modify or change our understanding of things to try to fit what we see happening. But I think that we can always go back to the foundation of this message and how it was laid down, what we saw in the past and the mistakes that were made in the past in Millerite history and in our own history in understanding where we were in the lines and, and just recognize that there are things that are typical that occur in our lines, but what we originally predicted still has not occurred. That is, we have not really come to raffia. We haven't come to midnight yet. And, and so when we're looking at what we had predicted about Islam, that still is future. That we have a raffia connected to Islam. And we have a paneum connected to Islam. But what's happening now is just typifying those events. So the story of Balaam still has Islam in, involved, but we can see that the Democrats can also be represented by an ass. Does that make sense to people? Well, yeah, isn't there, isn't there one of their symbols is a, I think it's a mule, which is a cross between an ass and a horse. The Democrats seem to favor Islam more than the Republicans do. Yeah. Um, okay, so, yeah, so a horse also represents Islam, right? Agreed. So there you have it. Okay, so I don't know much about the Americans. So so we have a donkey that is the Democrats. Now, why is that? Because they're stubborn. No, that's not why. I mean, I mean I'm just asking historically, why did they have a donkey represent the Democrats and an elephant the Republicans? I couldn't tell you, and I'm, I, I'm a former Democrat. Okay. Okay, so it says the Democrats were the first to use the donkey as their representative symbol in 1828 during the presidential campaign of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson, a popular, popular war hero, ran his election campaign under the slogan, let the people rule. More entertained than provoked, Jackson used the donkey on his posters after his opponents named him jackass due to his populist views and stubborn nature. But the person who is most responsible for making the donkey a symbol of the Democrats and the elephant the symbol of the Republicans was a cartoonist for Harper's Weekly magazine, Thomas Nest. So, so or Nast. So this was in 1870, 1870s or 1870, um, which is interesting. So Thomas Nast first used a donkey in a cartoon for Harper's Weekly titled A Live Jackass Kicking a Dead Lion. In 1870, that symbol truly became embedded in the American consciousness as synonymous with the Democratic Party. The cartoon depicts a donkey labored, labeled Copperhead Papers, Copperhead being a name given by Republicans to the more extreme faction of the Northern Democrats who opposed the Civil War and called for immediate peace. Kicking a dead lion, labeled Honorable E.M. Stanton, Abraham Lincoln's recently deceased Secretary of War, who Nast felt was being disrespected by the Democratic press. In a testament to the influence, influence wielded by Nast, the donkey almost instantly became the recognized symbol of the entire Democratic Party. 
And then it's four years later, NAS penned another cartoon, this time linking the elephant to the Republican Party. The animal elephant had already been featured as a Republican symbol by an Illinois newspaper during Abraham Lincoln's 1860 election campaign. Nast's drawing had the third term panic mocked the New York Herald, a paper that had been critical to Nast's close friends. Um, so it's interesting here, we have the elephant, well, is first represented in 1860 and the donkey in 1870. And so what does 187 and 186 symbolize? One eight seven, of course, is July eighteenth, and one eight six is is also July eighteenth. In that, it's one hundred and eighty six cardinal days from the first day of the first month to the tenth day of the seventh month, which is the one hundred and eighty seventh day of the year. Okay. So we have one eighty six from um, uh, the first day of the first month in eighteen forty four to the uh, April fifth, twenty thirty is 186 years, biblical years. And um, and then prophetic time, it's 187 prophetic years and 20 prophetic months. So you can see that 186 and 187 can symbolize the same thing. So here we have these two symbols, a donkey and an elephant. An elephant, of course, uh, where, where do we first understand the symbol of elephants? Yeah, and uh, there's just a note there on the chat regarding the 107 years from the 10th day of the seventh month um, uh, in the diagram, which we can go back to, I guess. Um, so I'll just quickly go over there. So, so you see where I'm getting at here with this this symbol of. So, what are these symbols involved with? Like historically. If you have the elephant in 1860, that's connected with what? So just to go back, there's 107 years between the Great Disappointment and Jeff Pippinger being born. So just a note there. Um, so, so if we have 1860, what's that for the elephant being connected with the Republicans? Yeah, uh, Abraham Lincoln, I think he was running for president around right. that time. Yeah, so it's going to be connected to Abraham Lincoln and, and the Republicans, which is a new party, relatively speaking. That's He's going to be the first Republican president. Okay, and then you have um, the 1870. Of course, that's a symbol for July 18th. But this still had to do with events after the Civil War, right? So can we say that these these symbols are connected with the Civil War in the United States? I would say yes. Yeah, okay, because that's when they first come become used in connection with that history. And so then we're going to have this, um, these symbols, we're, we're having Issachar, which is the donkey, now, the Bible doesn't have elephants in it, but what was the symbol of elephants being used for in this movement? Who was using elephants? Uh, Tess, Tess was using elephants. Okay, right. So Tess was using elephants. And what do they represent? Probably warfare. Okay, what kind of warfare? Uh, probably... Well, in this case, probably political. Uh, okay. I think it was uh, a new weapon. Yeah, they, they were weapon. a new we Exactly. They were a new weapon that was used, especially in Rafi and Paniam. Right. So they're dealing with the Battle of Rafi and Paniam. So, so we have the donkey here, you know, November 7th, but we know July or, or January 6th is also connected. I mean, it's not just a simple structure. Um, now, um, how many days from November 7th to January 6th? That would be what? How many days? Uh, 
that would be roughly 60 some days is that 60 pretty sure it's 60 and 60 i didn't hear you yeah i'm pretty sure but you know my math is abysmal so yeah so it should be 60 days okay so so what would that um is there any connection there well that's the 25 20 hours i think no maybe it's maybe it's 140 for sorry 1440 hours maybe yeah, it's you're correct. It's it's um, one thousand four hundred and forty hours. Okay, so so what that would that mean in in connection with with this line? Uh, so we can definitely add more to the line to the diagram that Stephen has, because we could add January sixth in there. Well, six is a uh, sixty is a multiple of six, and he said Reuben is connected with the man on the standard, right? And there you have the number six connected with the man. Okay. Okay. It's so a stretch. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, when we go here on this diagram of Stevens, we could add the sixty days to January sixth. So any anything else that we can do? <coughs> so we got the 107 years in here, and then we have 60 days. Well, then you have uh, 14 days till the inauguration. Yep, there's 14 days to the inauguration. So what would that represent? Three sevens, three twenty-five twenty symbolized. Anything? Okay. So the two sevens, so the two twenty-five twenties. That I mean, it's 14 days. We we already have. It's two periods of seven days, right? So we're dealing with the story of Joseph, where they have the seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. So, so maybe there's something more there that we would we would look at. Anything else? So one thing we can say is that this is still progressive. So Joe Biden being announced a winner, uh, when was the election? I think that was the third. Yeah, so the third. So there's, So from the time of the election, it's gonna be four days till he's announced the winner. Now, of course, this is the media announcing him the winner. Uh, do we have a specific date in which he officially becomes the winner? I mean, I, I don't know how, when when that's accomplished. I mean, it's, it happens quite progressively. So we have the media announcing him as the winner on November 7th. And what was that based upon? Why why did they announce him as the winner on November 7th? Had they finished counting all of the states yet? Um, no, but they had the electoral votes, but they but it wasn't all brought in at this point. Okay. So so January 6th is when they had the confirmation vote, right? Because that's why you have the 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 siege on Washington. Right. But on November 7th, had they, they, they hadn't counted everything yet, right? There still was a lot of states that were up in the air. That's correct. There was a bunch of states that had 
because they were counting and then double counting and they wanted a correct count because it was turmoil. Yeah, but there was some that really hadn't even been settled yet. I, I think by November 7th, right? There was, so, so I, I thought it was premature at the time. I mean, you know, Colin was saying that Trump was still going to win. You know, that the count would come out in his favor. Because I was at Collins on that day. So Colin was still denying that, that Trump was going to lose. So we saw a lot of people holding on to the hope that Trump was still going to win. So many people saw the the declaration of Biden as the winner on November 7th as, as purely a, uh, a political move on the part of the media. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay. So I don't remember exactly, you know, when they got everything all sort of settled. It was progressive. Anyway, from the election to to January 6th to the inauguration, these things happened over a period of time. Now, we know we have um, the 65 days, an inclusive count, from the election to January 6th, because Colin has marked that. Okay, so Angela says... Um, yeah, I don't say so I don't necessarily that they stole the election. I mean, I, I don't think um, I mean, we know that they there's a lot going on. So the main thing, the problem with the election is the irregularities with the election. So in a sense, they stole it um, because, you know, all this dead Republicans were now voting Democrat. Uh, you had. Of course, the fact that you had the mail-in ballots. So one of the things about Democrats is they're pretty lazy when it comes to voting. And so, so the fact that they had mail-in ballots made things a lot easier. But also, there was ballot harvesting going on. The question is, is that what actually won the election? And, and that's something we don't know. We don't know the total numbers. We know there was irregularities. I'm of the uh, order of hey, all this stuff is playing out through God's will, not necessarily man's will. Yeah. So the one thing uh, I don't... when it happens, they get all whacked out over it. It's like, wait a second, hold on, wasn't God steering this thing? Let's just try to understand it. Right. So one of the things I don't think we should get caught in the trap is somehow that that Trump was really the the winner of the election. Right. That's just a Republican uh, position. I mean, how do you decide the winner of an election? I mean, I you understand what I'm saying. By, by going through a whole process. And the process they went through was legal, even if there was irregularities. They chose to do that. So, you know, you can't say that Biden isn't the president or something like that. So some people tried to do that. Well, Biden's not really the president. You know, Trump really is. I think one thing, isn't he, isn't he sitting in the office? Isn't, isn't that the guy that, you know, every time they play the, the TV footage, uh, isn't that Biden that I keep seeing? That's right, not Trump. Right. right. So that's all I'm trying to say. Whatever you want to think about it, Biden's still the president. So Trump lost. Whether it was fair and square or not, it's not really the issue. Uh, the issue is that Biden is the president. And and what people were trying to do is say, well, we're going to have to somehow get Trump to be back to be president in order for this prophecy of Jeff's to be fulfilled, right? But we take the position that Jeff was correct, but our understanding of what this meant was incorrect, that this is something typical, Right. right. So Trump is the last president. He's not just the last Republican president. You know, he's the last president of the United States because understanding what January 6th was, if, if there was an insurrection, 
it wasn't an insurrection of the Republicans, you know, going into Washington, D.C. It was an insurrection that was created by the media, primarily, um, and by uh, Democrats. I agree. Oh, yeah, so it was overthrowing of the Constitution. Yes, but, it was done, but it was done in a way that, you know, it was kind of legal, right? You know, in the okay, sort of this... It was done through through craft, through deceit. But you know, yeah, most Americans like are, most Americans are going to accept that Trump is the president. You know, there's going to be some who are going to deny it. And, but 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 you see the point. The point is, when it came to the prediction and the prophecy, we don't have to we don't have to. You know, somehow have Biden not be president. We just have to understand what we were predicting. And that this was something typical. It was a typical line. And in order to understand the line properly, we need to understand what was being symbolized. So part of what's happening here, this is just my perspective, as we look at, at this, we can see that there is this, this message that is one of the enemies that has been allowed to remain to test God's people. And this is this papal spirit right? Sisera is going to manifest that, right? Parminder's movement is going to manifest that. It's going to infect our movement, and it's going to affect our understanding and interpretation of prophecy. And we have to get rid of Parminder's influence. That is, he has to be defeated. His understanding has to be defeated. And yet, much of what's happening now in the movement is actually still accepting many of the premises that Parminder laid down, particularly how we look at the lines, in that we believe that these lines are real and not typical. So if we're looking for a Sunday law in 2022, and we're looking for Trump to be reelected or somehow become president again in 2022, we would have a misunderstanding of the lines. We would still be teaching Parminder's understanding. And if we try to see Biden as illegitimate in, in, a, in a certain sense, we're still buying into a way of thinking that this movement has to reject. Now, now Iran says Trump is still exercising a lot of influence without the title of president. Well, that may be true, um, but I don't know if, I mean, I would think that Trump is losing. Uh, I mean, he definitely did not, was not able to uh, get the support of the majority of Republicans in regard to um, overthrowing the election. I mean, he couldn't get the vice president to overturn the election. But he wanted it done legal anyway, so he wasn't looking for um, an insurrection. But um, I don't think that, that the point is that Trump is not going to become president again. I mean, that's, that's the point. We're not going to see Jeff's prophecy fulfilled by Trump becoming president again. Because what is it that we see? We see here that Jeff's birthday is connected with this Joe Biden and this Issachar, this donkey, and this is connected to our understanding of the Civil War, right? And the symbols of July 18th. That's right. So, so we should recognize that, that this prophecy has been fulfilled, as Jeff predicted. It's just our understanding was incomplete we're looking at something that's typical and not actual so so when we're going to be looking at these lines we're going to be going through um, all of these uh, lines connected with these tribes that's the idea and, and I still I've worked out some more but I haven't worked them all out because I got to make them make sense but what's the basic principle that we're using when we connect these 
tribe numbers, to spans of times, to dates? What is it that we're looking for at the beginning and the end? Aren't we looking to find events that connect to some of these dates? Right, so they have to connect symbolically. Right. So you're not just going to have some arbitrary date, you know, and say, well, here we have this date, and it's uh, um, this event, but there's no connection. There's no logical connection between that event and the end date. So they have to be connected. Now, could they be symbolic dates connected with some of these spans of times? So that is a date that is a symbol. So let's say you took a span of time connected to something in our history and you went back into the past and it went to, let's say, October 22nd or, um, you know, April 26th or something like that, even though nothing happened on that particular year on those dates. Um, would that be at least a, a symbol? It can be, yes. Okay. Yes, I agree. Because we, we do that with future dates. So. Um, so it doesn't mean we always have to have event, but we can have a date that at least is symbolically connected to the event at the end. Right? So it can't just be any date that's a symbol. It has to be a date that ex actually explains the event that's being marked at, at the end. The first day, the first month, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so those types of things. So. So that's what we're looking at. But then it also must fit into a structure in some way. So one of the nice things about Stephen's diagram is that it's not just some date in the past and some date, you know, in the recent present, um, but it actually has this structure, the 69 days at the beginning and the 69 years and Jeff, Jeff's birthday, of course. Right, so these these become important uh, symbols that we have to, you know, we can't ignore them. We can't just say, because if we just had the great disappointment in Joe Biden being announced as the winner of the November 7th ele election, well, you know, people could say, well, you could have a lot of different dates that might be connected. We could go back, you know, and, and pick different dates in Millerite history, and they're going to connect with some date in our history. You know, especially if you have lots of spans of time like we do and you know the fact that you're going to have some connect that well that's kind of expected you're going to have some but here we have actually a structure and one of the things that we've been doing is connecting it to people's birthdays now now why is that important why, why would these birthdays you know we have miller's birthday we have pope pius the sixth birthday um we have, um, you know, my birthday, Stephen's birthday, Dwight's birthday, Iran's birthday. I mean, wh why these birthdays? Why, what's the importance of the birthday as a symbol? Where do well, we get? It looks from? like it's a signifier or a, um, a second witness. Okay, where's the first birthday? It's kind of a trick question, but. I'm sorry, what do you mean, where's the first birthday? In the Bible. First birthday in the Bible. If you look up the word birthday. Look up the word what? Birthday. Well, no, I mean, obviously people are born. So, so we could, we're not going to count. Pharaoh's birthday. We have Pharaoh's birthday, right? Came to pass. It came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday. So what do we have here as a symbol? We have an interesting 40, 20 or 42, three and a half months, 12, 60 years. Okay. Yeah. And you have... A third day mentioned is third day significant as a symbol. Yeah, Dwight, is it significant? Very definitely. Okay, because Dwight does a study on the third day, 
right? And we know it shows up in, uh, and, and, and when Tabo presented the prediction before midnight, uh, this was the first one that he uses, is in the story of Joseph, dealing with the butler and the baker's two dreams and the symbol of the third day. So he takes this as the prediction before midnight. One of the symbols is this. He also goes to the three days at the river Ahava on the 12th day of the first month when the, after this three days that they leave the river Ahava. But we also have the third day um, at the end of that. You know, there's three days um, from when they called to repent for their marriage to their strange wives. And so we've used three days as a symbol in this movement, uh, which is a call to repentance, right? But now we also have this symbol of birthday. So, I mean, this is Pharaoh's birthday. I know Jehovah's Witnesses, they make a whole case out of this because the only birthdays mentioned in the Bible are Herod's birthday and Pharaoh's birthday, and they're both bad people, so they say we shouldn't celebrate birthdays. Um, but do we have another birthday that's not directly related to his birthday, but is a, that appears to be connected to a birthday in the Bible, and where would that be? So I wouldn't put this as the first birthday. Okay, well, Christ's baptism, okay. Um, how about if we go to Noah? Yeah, especially Noah's. Okay, right. So we know that it's going to be a connection connected with Noah. Well, it, there, there's a very tacit reference here. Right. Because you're dealing with the 600 to the 601st year. Right. So we have the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, right? Right. And then we know that this flood, it, I mean, it ends progressively, right? But it's going to be, uh, where is this? Um, and it came to pass in, um, in the 600th and first year, in the first month, in the first day of the month. And, and so, so we, we're going to know that Noah was 600, and then he's going to be 601, right? Because this is counting in reference to Noah's age. Right. And, and so the first day of the first month, in, in a symbolic sense, would represent Noah's birthday. Whether he was actually born on the first day of the first month, and that's what they're counting from. I don't know, but uh, and this, of course, is not not under inspiration. But in Uncle Arthur's uh, Bible story book, they said they that this, this was Noah's six hundred and first birthday, and they made the day special by removing uh, the roof of the ark. Um, so you know, obviously, that's not an inspired book, right. but the implication here is that this is his 600th year that this happens. And so in a sense, this is a type of birthday. And, and maybe that's how they counted their births. Maybe they always counted from, uh, you know, just the month that you're born in or something like that. Not particularly the day. I don't know. But so what do we have here as a symbol then with this birthday? Is it, the question is, is it a prophetic marker? Well, there's many things that are associated with it. Like you said, the number 600, the, uh, the, uh, the day, first day, first month. Yeah. So there, there, are, there are several symbols that are in, in, ingrained in this little story there. Yeah, so birthdays become prophetic markers, and they mark what? An event, an end, whoa, wait. <laughs> well, Mark, what kind of event? What What is it that they're marking? Well, with Noah, it was marking the um, settling of the ark, right? Okay, how about the beginning of a period? Yes. Okay, I can buy that. 
And especially here, we have the first day of the first month. So we can sort of say that the, a birthday can mark mark this, that start of something. Right. So, so that's why when we count 18,720 days from a birthday, because God declares the end from the beginning, we're going to be tied to something that's going to be significant as a symbol. It's going to tie the beginning to the end. Right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, it's, so it's a simple thing. That's why these birthdays are here. Does it make the people, you know, special or anything? They happen to be uh, used as a symbol. Their birthdays can be used as a symbol. They can be, of course, significant people in the movement and so forth. But uh, the idea is that, um, you know, when we count for Miller's birthday and we see a symbol there, right? Then, then we have to, you know, we we have to mark it, right? I mean, it has to be part of a line and the beginning of a line, but then we can get to the end of it, All right? So, so that's what we're doing. That's why we're we're looking at these because this is the series on understanding the lines, right? That's primarily the the importance of this series and what we're trying to do. So, you know, when we look at something like uh, you know, uh, the birthday even of Pope Pius. It's going to be on December 25th. Well, December 25th is already a symbol. It's going to be 1717. Well, a doubling, right? 17 is also a symbol. Right? So that, that's something that shows up. Uh, story of Joseph. Um, so you're going to have all of these different these different symbols but it's only because they come together in these structures that they actually can then, then we can understand what they mean. And just because you can create a structure doesn't mean that you have a correct understanding of a structure unless you know, understand how it fits uh, symbolically. Right? So people have created structures that are correct, but interpreted them incorrectly. Well, that's our history. Right. That's our history. That's what we do. So so in order to understand these correctly, we need to look at everything. We pull all the lines together. We look at line upon line. We look at wheel within wheel. We, we come to understand where we are in the lines. And then we can understand what it is we're looking at. Doesn't mean we can predict what's going to happen on an event in the future. But at least we have some idea that when an event occurs, we can understand its significance because it's fit, fit into part of a structure, these lines. And, the, and, and watch, but it gives us a, something to actually look for. Um, we might not see it in the exact way that we're thinking it, but we have the symbology. And it's, if we're marking down the symbology of the things that are transpiring during that event, we can get a closer handle on it. That's why I yeah. say we can't figure it out until it goes by. Right. Okay. So we're going to continue this, I guess, tomorrow because there's still, and I'm going to try to get some time today. We had a pretty busy day ahead of me, uh, but I'm try try to get some of these lines pulled together so that we can understand this section of judges. Okay. Any final comments before we close with prayer? Just another study with a lot of balls in the air. Yep. Yep. A lot of things that we haven't had settled down and put in place yet. Okay. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the light that has been shining upon our path and for the time that we had to study and for the way that you lead and direct uh, the hearts and minds of people in this movement. And we just ask, Lord, for your continued watch care over us. We pray, Lord, that we can, um, as we progress in our understanding, that we can reflect your character and that we can be a witness to those around us. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.